right. Good morning, everybody. So um, it's really good weather out there. I don't know how many of you are staying in the hotel, but uh, thank you for coming and not just kind of hanging out outside. Let's hope we make it worth your time. So I'm Kamala Desika, and um, I work for, for Pivotal. Uh, how many of you here know Pivotal Company? Awesome. This is great. All right. So then um, all I have to tell you really is I work on the technical alliances team at Pivotal and that makes me lucky enough to work with awesome people like Michael. Michael, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, my name is Michael Ng. I work in the product management team in Confluent and I, fe I specialize in platform engineering and I own the Kubernetes strategy. Uh, strategy. So this is uh, a subject that's near and dear in our heart and uh, we will be focusing on, on our partnership today in our talk. And we'll also have Victor Gamov join us soon on the stage. We will cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about um, microservices, cloud native applications, how we're going to um, actually transfer from an older architecture to a cloud native one. And we'll talk about modernizing infrastructure for, for Kubernetes. And we'll show a live demo. And that's where Victor Gamov, one of our developer advocates, will join us on the stage to show you um, everything that we talked about live. That's a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, right? So Pivotal has been at the center of a lot of digital transformations in enterprises, right? And what we've seen there is really enterprises are wanting to deliver software continuously. Whereas before, they used to have a uh, convergence of various roadmaps where from a different variety of teams, they would create one single big monolithic application deploy that as, at a particular designated time on particular designated infrastructure, which may involve restarting and essentially downtime for the end user. And therefore, because of all of the risk involved with that kind of a deployment model, it was done very sparingly. Now, that's not very forgiving in today's fast world of software deployment, right? And especially now when everybody expects everything to be up all the time, so you're gonna need all these specialized teams with non-trivial engineering expertise to keep your application running and secure and patched at all times. So the model has effectively changed, right? So we're now doing microservices and composite applications. Uh, these microservices have decoupled their, um, their roadmaps, they decoupled their, uh, their data dependencies. Now, it could be based on an event model, it could be based on event architectures, but essentially what you're able to do at this point is reduce that cycle time because now you can deploy individual parts of the application at uh, your own uh, schedule. Right, And then you're able to deploy it to infrastructure that is effectively what we can say disposable. That doesn't mean you don't need the infrastructure, it just means that you don't have to think about it at all times. And what that means is that now you're ready for production at any given point of time. So if you're doing a continuous delivery model, all of this automation from the infrastructure level upwards is enabling you to be ready for production at any given point of time. And all of the tools and everything that are converging as third-party platforms, as part of your uh, third-party services, as part of your platform, will enable your operations teams to deliver services and not necessarily think of the world as servers. Now, this kind of a model where you are doing continuous delivery, uh, DevOps, and delivering your software in the form of microservices is what has come to be known as cloud native. And with the platform essentially enabling this kind of application architectures and this kind of software delivery model is now more important than ever as becoming the framework that's bringing together all of the various teams and becoming that framework with which the common language with which the teams are communicating with each other, um, the shared vocabulary and the shared services that everybody is using across the board so that an ID in the morning can actually ship by the evening. Now, as part of this, as developers, now we all want things to be automated. Now, when you think about the distance between where the application is de deployed to where the application was traditionally deployed, um, which, is, which might be hardware or something like that, the industry has really come up with a variety of different solutions with which to look at how, what levels to automate across the board here, right? So we really should know our abstractions. So what do we have here? We've got the traditional model where we've got the hardware. Um, you know, everyone's familiar with, with this 
People are also familiar with the infrastructure as a service. We're all, we all know, uh, we've known VMware for a while and now we have the public cloud services. Now there's this new thing, container as a service. And Kubernetes has by far dominated this area, right? And most of the cloud providers now also have distributions uh, based on Kubernetes for a variety of, um, for, for a, in a variety of uh, productized offerings. Then we have Cloud Foundry, which has dominated the platform as a service space uh, in a lot of enterprise workloads. Uh, and then of course now we have function as a service as well for certain kinds of applications. So what does this translate to as a developer? How many of you have used any of these, well, from container as a service? How many of you are using container as a service? Awesome. How many of you are using platform as a service? There's fewer. Anyone using functions? Hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Great. So I don't have to tell you what kind of applications to deploy where, right? And of course, those of you who have taken pictures are good and set to go. Um, that said, I think that what I do want to point out really is 12 factor and uh, 15, factor, 15 factor applications. You really want to automate and start from the highest level of abstraction as possible so that you get the most amount of productivity that you can get from your platform. Now, most enterprises are really thinking of this as, hey, should I go all in on a PaaS or should I go all in on a CAS? Um, you know, should I just stay on virtualized infrastructure? And the, truth is, the truth is really you want to be able to spread your workloads across the gamut of abstractions available to you, right? Because some applications are really uh, more suited, the productivity will be better, um, in a certain level here. Now, how do I know which app falls where? Right? So come back, coming back, we're just going to step back out of this whole platform world and abstractions and things like that. Ultimately, what do I want as a developer? I want to have automation. I want a resilient deployment target. Um, I want logging, monitoring, and auditability. Um, I want to be able to do blue-green deployments without a ton of uh, work on the back end or ha throwing a number of bodies at the problem. If my um, container goes down or if my pod goes down, is the platform going to be able to do that work for me and bring it back up? Does it have health management that's built into it? These are all the considerations you want to think about it. And so when you're doing a new application, it should be fairly simple. The answer to, you know, where should this land? highest level of abstraction possible so I can get the most amount of productivity out of it, right? But if it's an existing workload, and like most of the workloads in the enterprise are existing workloads, and they're not built 15 factor or 12 factor or any of those factors, right? So what do I do with those? That's when you have to think about, does this app, you know, really have to change very often? Does this app have a lot of developers that are working on it that whose time, if saved, will actually be meaningful? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, it's landed in the top right corner, you should be spending your time on it to try and move it up to a higher level of abstraction. If the answer to both of those questions is no, leave it as it is. Not everything has to be changed, right? And there are going to be a variety of things that kind of fall into that gray area in the spectrum. And there's additional analysis that you can do to think about where that lands. Now, for that application, you want to think about you know, the business implications, right? Is it critical to my business? Are there customers using that particular application? And um, if I change the frequency of that application or if I change the number of features, is, does it have a large backlog that has to reach the market? So if the answer to all of those questions, you're gonna give a score to that application. Then there are economic implications. You wanna think about, hey, does that application you, you know, with, with some kind of uh, utilization that might be better if I move it to container as a service or if I move it off the hardware, am I going to benefit from that? Are there cost savings from that? Um, are there, you know, is there going to be revenue impact from being able to uh, move that application to a container as a service, meaning if I have SLAs to meet and if I'm spending a ton of money on those SLAs, is that going to have an economic impact to my application? If the answer to that is yes, you want to give that a score. Similarly, on the technical side, 
Um, is it dependent on the, uh, on the operating system? Is it easy to separate? Does it have meaningful seams in which to kind of split the application? What about the data dependencies? If the answer to that is it's simple enough to do, I would assign a score to that. Once you've kind of done this sifting and the funneling process, you're going to land with apps across the spectrum where you're going to have some that are just easy to containerize, lift and shift, and put it on a container as a service, right? And then there might be some that you might want to just replatform with this minor amount of changes where you convert a monolith into maybe a four-factor four or a seven-factor application, and then it runs on the PaaS, but it won't get all the benefits that you would get from the PaaS. There might be others where you might want to do a more uh, effort and refactor that into a 12-factor or a 15-factor application, bootify your app, um, and essentially create the data service, maybe create, make an event service out of it, and run that on the PaaS or the functions as a service. If you app is old enough and the entire team has left the company, as has happened sometimes, um, you're probably better off just rebuilding the thing, right? So as you go through this, you're going to have a number of um, patterns that you're going to have throughout the enterprise where you have, you know, a monolith, a distributed monolith, and microservices. Oh, and hello, over here on the side here, event-driven microservices using Kafka. Now, I've talked a lot about applications here so far, right? Now, what about Kafka and what about data? And this is where I come in to actually explain to you now how data fits into cloud-native um, applications and also your architectures and in your cloud native um, environments, right? Um, and we all know data is like critical to your digital businesses today, right? Um, this is a slide from The Economist that basically is, is emphasizing this, um, this um, idea that um, a lot of businesses today run uh, their profitability on data. And data is the new oil. The data and the oil need to be refined so that you can actually get a true meaning from it. Right, and that's why it's really critical. And so how does all of this fit into cloud native and, and microservices, as uh, Kamala was talking about, right? And we're in uh, Kafka Summit, so I'm a lot of people already know this, but um, <coughs> I'm gonna then try and, and, and show you guys how a uh, streaming data platform helps with the microservices architectures and how it actually helps with the isolation of services to actually promote this kind of architecture, right? Um, but before we go there, uh, let's just talk about events and what they are, right? And so an event can be anything like a sale in your, in your application, um, in your business, an invoice of an order, a trade, or a customer experience. Uh, but all of these are just individual events, right? And your company really is a series of all of these events and capturing all of this in, in historical context and reacting to all of this to, uh, to drive meaning and to drive value to your business, right? And all of these um, points of data, like as I was talking about events um, and, and transactions, invoices, um, and sales, all of them need to be aggregated together in a platform that forms streams of events that are um, real time, that have historical context, um, that are timeline series, that you can then um, have other applications subscribe to it and then use it as a data platform. And all of that then becomes critical to your business as, as data, right? But how do then events actually help microservices? And so um, I'm gonna argue that events actually help the actual architecture of microservices by truly um, isolating the boundaries of your microservices because you really wanna break down everything from monolith to microservice and event platforms help with that as a synchronous message queue, I'm, I'm gonna show you, right? And so this is an example of uh, e-commerce e application that we've refactored into microservices architectures, right? We have a order service, a shipping service, customer service, and a web server that takes in requests for orders, right? And so it's a simple uh, application that I'm trying to show a concept where uh, an order comes in, the order service takes the order, and then the shipping service actually will ship the order that the order was submitted. But in order to do that, the customer service, um, microservice needs to actually tell the shipping service the address of the orders. And all of this is done through procedural calls, right? So even though you've like 
put a lot of effort to actually refactor this into individual services that are supposed to be isolated. The data that um, it's using is not isolated. It's still, there's a lot of dependencies um, to, your, to your, each of these services, so they're not truly isolated um, because there's no Kafka, right? So how does it look now with Kafka in the picture, right? Um, let's refactor the order service. And so now the order service no longer is, is making an RPC call to the, to the shipping service to actually tell it to ship something. Right. When an order comes in, it actually just um, publishes the event on a topic on Kafka, and then the shipping service listens to that topic to actually know that an order has come in so that it can ship it. But we're still uh, depending on the customer service service to actually give the address to be shipped. Um, and so it's not truly um, an isolated service either. So let's refactor that. And now um, the... Um, the shipping service is also um, able to then uh, publish and subscribe to events for the data for the customer data itself and the addresses there. So then you can actually get data from the uh, message broker in a sort of like time series sort of timeline to actually get the data. Now you can actually see they're truly isolated. The data is actually all um, fire and forget on Kafka, and that's how then it actually isolates all the microservices, and that's why Kafka is critical in sort of a cloud-native kind of experience, right? It feeds into what Kamala was saying. And so at scale, this is even more helpful because I only showed you three microservices, but at scale, you could have hundreds of these microservices that uh, subscribe and publish data onto Kafka, and this helps more in your, in your journey to actually break down your monolith to microservices, right? So now we talked a lot about data and how Kafka helps with microservice architectures. Um, let's talk about infrastructure and modernizing Kafka, right? So we know a lot of customers run Kafka on physical infrastructure and VMs. The next generation is to actually run it on um, more um, orchestration type platforms and Kubernetes is, is the big thing that's happening this year. So, so I'll, I'll focus a bit more on that, right? Um, but actually, why run Kafka on Kubernetes, right? So this is sort of an insight from some of our, our Confluent customers from last year saying that about a third of them are planning to run Kafka um, on Kubernetes for production. Is that true? Like, how many people are, are thinking of doing that today in this crowd? Right, so it's about 25% maybe. And so that's a good um, sort of gamut from the crowd as well. And this survey was taken last year, and uh, we're hearing more feedback that's uh, gathering even more momentum this year. But why really do that on, on Kubernetes? Uh, why is this push, right? And I would argue that the real, the, the real push to that is because of microservices adoption, right? Um, there's just a lot of people trying to like, uh, adopt these kind of cloud-native architectures that Kamala was talking about. And through microservices, it drives container adoption and it drives container orchestration adoption, right? As we were saying, microservices helps all um, um, development sort of scale independently, break down organiz organizationally as well to be more efficient. And once you do that, though, you need um, also a deployment pattern that supports that. And containers help you do that by actually isolating the deployment for each service by themselves. You can actually um, have all the services sort of uh, be developed in their own um, coding language, and containers help you do that, right? Um, but that's really nice, but once you have a lot of microservices, then how do you handle that? And so orchestration then sort of helps you um, do that at scale, where now they have lots of containers running. How do you deploy all of them in a production way that's scalable? Um, Kubernetes actually helps you do that. Cloud Foundry also helps you do that, right? Um, with sort of orchestration, then you have all these microservices running each other. They actually need to be able to um, easily discover each other. And, and um, container orchestration automates all of that in an easy way, helps you scale all of these things in, uh, independently. It also makes it highly available. There are tools that are built in to actually uh, restart your services for you um, easily to do that with Kubernetes. And it abstracts all the hardware, right? As a developer, you don't need to care too much about the hardware that's um, running the actual orchestration platform, right? So, and we know that the world also thinks, though, that running Kafka on Kubernetes is difficult. How many of you have heard of this name, Kelsey Hightower? Quite a few, okay. Um, how many of you heard about uh, Gwen Shapira? More, so we know Gwen's more popular than Kelsey in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, why not everyone, right? It's Kafka Summit. And so um, this is just like quotes from them that basically say, you know, you can run stateful um, workloads on Kubernetes, but they can be a challenge, especially like complicated distributed uh, stateful uh, applications, right? And the key, though, is that you require a lot of operational knowledge about how the distributed application, like Kafka, runs. And you need a lot of um, understanding of how it, do, how, it, how it does that before you can actually safely deploy. Kubernetes gives you a lot of uh, primitives, like stateful sets, um, objects to run storage, objects to run networking, security, things like that. But if you don't know how your application actually works natively, it's really hard to do by ourselves. And these are like sort of examples of uh, what they are, like, like translating from a um, traditional architecture to um, a Kubernetes one, it's not easy, right? Going from VMs to servers, not so easy. Um, doing security is, is really complicated itself with Kafka. Trying to do that with Kubernetes is also a challenge, right? Uh, managing configuration, upgrades, all of this can be really challenging if you have not a lot of experience doing this um, um, on your own and then translating to Kafka, uh, Kubernetes, right? And so that's why we actually actually have this offering called Confluent Operator, which is actually our first foray into Kubernetes deployments, where it's our custom controller that actually creates custom resources to deploy Kafka on Kubernetes easily, and where we can actually automate the provisioning of this in, a, in minutes, literally. And uh, we'll show in the, in, in the demo where Victor has already deployed it, but we will see how it's, it's done for you in a very simplified way. And uh, you don't need to know too much about Kubernetes to use this. Uh, we'll export all the metrics so that you can then um, easily do this on Kubernetes by monitoring the cluster that's running on Kubernetes already. And we'll use the native Kubernetes um, on ways of, of scaling this so that you can actually scale up and down very simply as well, right? And this is just more deep dive of what those uh, things are, right? As you can see, um, all you need to know is declaratively what components you need like Kafka, Zookeeper, whether or not you want to use Control Center for monitoring. You tell us that in a, in a simple YAML file and how many sort of Kafka brokers you need by the replica account, and we'll go ahead and deploy all of this on Kubernetes for you as pods. You don't even need to know about pods to actually use this. And we'll create load balancers to, to provide you external access to the, to the Kafka brokers, and then create like storage objects for you to actually have persistence, right? <clears throat> Once we're there, uh, we, you can scale horizontally as well, right? But it's not just about adding brokers. Once you add the brokers themselves, you actually need to balance the data appropriately so they can actually use all of that capacity, right? So in our future, we actually plan to automate a lot of these things that are like, highly manual and can actually cause a lot of issues while you're actually doing this for your cluster. And we'll do it in a very smart way with data balancing as part of the actual scale up, scale down operation to actually complete this elasticity that we're talking about um, um, with uh, Kafka and Kubernetes. And upgrades are really important as well, and it can be really challenging. Um, how many people think that upgrades are hard for Kafka and clusters? Yeah, we have some people waving. What's that? What other people think, they don't think it's hard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you, you, the rest must think it's easy. But actually, it is quite challenging. And we actually have a lot of operational knowledge from just running Kafka in production and from customers um, that tell us that um, we can actually build a lot into, into our operator, right? Where, for example, when we do rolling upgrades, it actually gives it a highly available experience, right? And what we actually build into the operator is some intelligence to actually, when you actually upgrade, you stop the broker, upgrade the broker, but we wait for it to be um, zero under replicated because as you keep rolling it, if you do not do this, um, the upgrades take longer, and also uh, you have issues with um, just throughput for the for the uh, cluster as it keeps trying to keep up with replication, right? And um, we have more automated um, items where you can actually just tell us, hey, we want to enable SASO plane or mutual TLS with your own certificates. You actually configure all of that, and it will deploy it for all the components that you want underneath the covers, right? And so I didn't want to uh, take too much time from the actual demo, but this is actually going to show you what all of the concepts I mean with our deployment on Kubernetes. And um, what we're going to show you is a, is a sort of a, a, a nice use case that ties everything that we talked about, right? We talked about microservices, and we talked about Kafka running on Kubernetes with streaming data. So Victor is going to join us on stage now to actually um, 
have the all action sort of part of the actual um, session. And what we'll do is there is going to be two apps that are running, a rider app and a driver app. And the driver is going to actually hail a ride and then go ahead and, and, and finish off. And then we'll show you all of that running on Kubernetes. We'll see how it goes, right? Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Who uh, doesn't love a live demo? Want. And uh, this demo is 50% uh, of uh, magic, 50% of science, and 100% delivers to your expectations, right? <laughs> it's going to be uh, some, some cool stuff. All right. So um, <coughs> as you can see, demo starts with some errors. I think it's a good sign. <laughs> I just need to start some of the port forwarding because I'm running something in my remote um, in my remote data center and I can't dial. Like I said, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting thing because the, the conference Wi-Fi this is something that you can always rely on, as you know. So this is why I'm doing things. Um, so first of all, uh, we have uh, some of the Kafka cluster is uh, deployed in my GCP. Uh, I cannot rely on my laptop the way how I rely on uh, on, on the cloud. So that's why everything runs in um, in cloud. So let me see if a connectivity is actually is working, and I restore uh, my connectivity. So uh, we already have a pre-provisioned some cluster, but uh, it took us just like five minutes before presentation. Uh, you can trust me. Uh, I'm not going to do this on stage, even though I'm very tempted to do that. Um, so a couple of things that you can see because using the standard tools uh, in this case uh, my um, What is K? What is K? K is my coop control. It's just a oh, very easy to to use this aliases now I showing you the some pods that deployed I have a uh, three nodes of Kafka brokers three nodes of the keeper and uh, as you know, the uh, things that uh, the Kafka is, uh, requires storage for that matter I need to use the stateful sets. I need to use mm -hmm. other things, but I don't want to do that I just want to deploy my Kafka cluster. Would it be nice if we just have this uh, tool like a coop control just understand that I want to deploy not the persistent volumes, not the services, nothing. I just want to deploy my Kafka. So let's see if we can do that. So if we can do get Kafka, uh, maybe my um, coop control will actually understand. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, it does. So the way how it works, uh, we have this concept of customer source definition, and uh, this customer source definition are responsible for uh, dealing with the resources like Kafka, Zookeeper, and some other components of the Confluent platform that also deploy as a part of operator deployment. So, if I will uh, show you how my um, um, like Kafka uh, and with my this is my customer resource. This is how it looks like. This is how I want to deal with my infrastructure. When I was talking about like this, uh, the, the code-driven uh, infrastructure, when something that we're describing, I don't want to go into low-level details. I want to focus on my thing. And when I said I want to focus on my thing, I want to focus on my Kafka. So this is my uh, configuration, my GVM parameters, my uh, configuration for metrics reporter, since I want to have the monitoring and stuff. Um, the uh, defaults and configurations, like a number of replicas and topic, whatnot. And most important thing is that is the how my client will be able to connect to this application. This is a configuration that exposed through this remote service, so your application can discover this without going into these like uh, the hard coded parameters and things. That's the load balancers I was telling you about. And uh, Victor, if you scroll up really quickly a little bit, you will see it's this is a custom resources um, call. Kafka cluster, right? The type is that, and that's what is actually being deployed by the <coughs> operator that I was telling you about. So this is, yeah, this is custom resource. This is what we're dealing with. This is, uh, this is what you will be dealing with when you, uh, or you want to deal with when you're deploying this. So um, in terms of like monitoring things, so let's see if my cluster is up and, up and running. My cluster is actually up and running, and uh, things are working very nicely here. So let's go to this application. Uh, as uh, Michael announced, let's see if it actually works, and it doesn't, as always, because it's a live demo, things will break, and I forgot just to put forward my, um, my, uh, the container from one place to another. Um, if you, uh, like a thrill seeker like myself, you will be always doing these live demos and will enjoy this on the stage. Now, most important thing, that uh, the, the, the idea of this app is to uh, t how show you how two microservices can be integrated. Um, you use the ride-sharing applications, obviously, somehow, probably, if you 2000, in 2019, uh, and you have a cell phone, you probably did this. At least, at least done this once. Yeah, yeah, and the, since we're in London, like, um, I want to uh, see if I can go and visit uh, a queen. 
um, in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and now, as a rider, I want to, I, I put myself here. So this is me, this is, I'm here. And my driver um, immediately sees that I didn't restart, refresh the screen. I just, uh, I just pressed it and uh, my rider appeared here. So let me show you once again. I will click here and another page is changed. So all this communication happens through technologies known as uh, Apache Kafka yeah. or Confluent Platform, Kubernetes. So from one place, it goes into space, it goes into cloud. After that, it got, lands in the Kafka. In this cloud thing, in this space thing, we have my microservice app running, consume the message, and after that, send this from space to the stage. Now, my driver sees me, and after that, let's say, I want to go and pick up this guy. Still have previous coordinate, live demo, what you can do. <laughs> um, so in this case, the, uh, my guy, so let's start over, let's start over. So forget about this, what you've seen before. I'm not gonna move this anymore. S start over, okay. So um, again, my driver will be right here. Come on, come on, yes, it's here. I'm going here and boom, now it's working. So I think it's a, it's a applause, right? <laughs> so what is happening right now? So the app is actually, uh, uh, the uh, car is driving to the point where this, uh, the passenger uh, is in the real time, and this communication happens between two apps going through the Kafka topic, and uh, the actual time that takes the car to get to this guy is actually take um, exactly the same time how much that it will take in the real world. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper how it looks like, what it took me to, um, to do this kind of thing. So first of all, we have a couple things here. Um, so let me uh, bring the pods again. The um, Kafka cluster managed by Confluent operator, and uh, this, this is something that uh, will be, the operator will be responsible for doing things like scaling. So how you would scale this in production. You know. will go through a uh, release, you submit the like, change request, things Actual like provision, that. Actually provision, new VMs, yeah, all of this provision. stuff, right? So you can continue talking and I will be you know, scaling my cluster. Yeah. And so what Victor will do is he'll actually show you how he can easily do this um, with actual kube controller commands, right? Um, and as you can see here, he's actually editing the actual um, sort of custom resource itself. There's right? so many places uh, to make a mistake. And so you saw there was three pods, and what he'll do is actually just add a broker and actually scale it really quickly. Yeah, once again, I will bring this, um, I will bring this, this is number of brokers that my cluster has right now, and uh, this uh, little tool that uh, also ships with operator called um, the Confluent Control Center also knows how to you know, track things like, you know, this is how my driver and rider communicate through the driver and rider topic, yeah. obviously. Um, and uh, so what I will do here, uh, usually you not do things like this in production. You're not tapping into your coop control, edit your resource. You probably will do things like Helm, you will provision new release, yeah. so you want to have this, you know, the abil uh, ability to do things right way. But, you know, since we're on the, on the stage, let's do stupid things and see <laughs> how uh, things play out. So, what I did right now, I just uh, went, to the, the, thanks to this edit command that's available from Kube Control, I went there and I changed resource, the Kafka cluster resource, in this page, uh, in, this, um, in this cluster, and it's, uh, uh, let's see how it works. Um, so the, my pods, you will see in a three, two, one, yes. So now, from the previous stage, I have only three ports of Kafka, and now I have a four ports. The port is not uh, fully uh, ready, so it's this initializing right now. Yeah, so this why control center is not uh, is not seeing this right now. Um, but as you can see, it actually scales it really quickly, right? Yeah. So the the, the port was provisioned. Uh, all these the things underneath were happening, like all this um, all this cool stuff. With the uh, now we have this rolling uh, rolling yeah. upgrades with the uh, rolling restart of these other nodes because we're updating the, uh, the configuration uh, of the cluster. Um, control center should work. Application still working. 
I think it's still successful. Yeah. So while the clusters of the application is working, we continue yeah, because delivering. The, the, the Kafka cluster itself that has all the topics is still highly available. It's doing a rolling upgrade and it's not really like shutting down the actual. Uh, yeah, and one itself. last thing that I want to show that the application is a Spring Boot application. Uh, Spring Boot has excellent integration with all things Kafka, and uh, we, you, if you like to just write a simple listener like so for consumer, you will do that. Uh, if you do something complex uh, like, like I do here, like web sockets, the, the REST interfaces integration with the Kafka, different serialization formats, it's, uh, the Spring Boot also. Uh, supports all that. So if I will do here and can uh, log of my uh, of my pod where I'm running this application, um, again it goes into space. Just uh, have some some patience, and after that, doing something in the space, doing something in the in the in the cloud thing. So uh, we should be able to see Spring Boot. So I'm not lying. Everything is available. You can grab this demo, by the way, on the GitHub. If you go to uh, GitHub. Um, and um, most importantly, I was a little bit um, kind of like a smart ass to call this demo K-Lift, like a Kubernetes <laughs> Kafka lift thing, right? Um, and this is pretty much it. So uh, we continue here. Michael? Yep. And so what we all saw here was actually a demo of everything that was provisioned with our Confluent operator. And I just want to share um, sort of the GA plans for this, right? Um, we are... Wrapping up this thing, what, what we call private preview, which is basically our uh, internal beta with 24 customers actually running this with different sort of laterals. And we are in the final stages of actually in this preview. And we're going to launch um, this really soon. So I'll stay here. I'm not sure if we have a lot of time for questions, but I'll stay here. And you can ask me more questions about uh, our operator if you're interested. Right. Great. So cloud native landscape. Right. How many of you are doing Kubernetes, uh, like open source? Any, anyone here doing, doing it yourself? Awesome. Well, from, from my perspective, that's super hard to do. Um, so we've, you know, we, with Pivotal and Confluent, we've actually collaborated and uh, created this uh, partnership, essentially where we're running, uh, again, making use of all of the abstractions where you have Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you have the PaaS instance running your Spring Boot applications, Confluent running inside uh, Pivotal Container Service, which is uh, our Kubernetes uh, distribution. Um, if you guys you know, want to try it out, let us know. Talk to us uh, below the stage when we're done. Yep, and we're investing heavily um, together as companies where um, we definitely have tried a lot of this on, on Pivotal Container Service. And we're improving our integration points uh, with different things like service brokers in the future. But um, as you can tell, we're investing a lot. We're on stage together. So uh, this is going to be a really good uh, partnership between us. All right. All right. All right. And uh, most important slide. Thank you very well, much for all your you. time. Yeah. We hope you found it beneficial.